Signature, I can do that. Thank you. My my signature. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah
support the entire package and members will be no, it's a it's an egg McMuffin cross cross with a hockey puck. Oh, this one. Just like the just like the Do you get into any of this stuff for your problem? Yeah, the problem is getting it approved. They don't have that. Yeah. What did you do? Yeah. for inviting me, first of all. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, even at this hour in the morning. But let me tell you about um, Edwin Cooper. He uh, is <laughs> far senior to me, believe it or not, and he's been at UCLA a long time. We have a generic email suffix at UCLA, which is mednet at ucla.edu. And the convention is that you, the, the, the initial part is your initial and last name. But he has not provided by that. He just goes by Cooper at UCLA.edu. Over the years, he's had many, many of my emails. Goodness knows how many, because they, he doesn't always forward them to me. He, sort of, he forwards the ones that he feels has sufficient gravity. I didn't hear anything about this exchange that was going on. And anyway, I... Um, I'll get my disclosure in a moment. I'm going to talk to you about um, biologic therapies and the treatment of severe asthma. Um, and here is my disclosure. I'll allow you to read this. Um, I retired from being full-time faculty in March 2016. I still run a research lab, and we have NIH funding through the Spiromics uh, COPD cohort. So, frankly, this is my main area of interest. And when Dr. Altman asked me if I'd come and give a talk on biologics and severe asthma. I said, asthma? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm not nearly as expert in the field of asthma as some of my other colleagues at GSK, but um, I certainly have tried to put together a talk um, that is reasonably balanced, and I had no idea um, that I was going to be seeing 
having so many industry colleagues uh, in the room, so hopefully it is sufficiently balanced, but it, this could lead to a, a very interesting discussion, I think. I joined GSK in April 2016, and I work for their global respiratory franchise, so mainly engaged in developing an internal medical education program and for external scientific engagement. So let's get started. Um, in asthma and COPD, in fact, in inflammatory airways in general, there is this uh, endeavor currently um, to identify phenotypes. In fact, Spiromics, the project I'm involved with in COPD, is all about identifying sub-phenotypes through biomarkers, intermediary biomarkers, that could uh, lead to targeted or personalized therapies and that would therefore make the development of new drugs much easier uh, because we wouldn't have to wait for much longer term clinical outcomes like disease progression or mortality necessarily. And then within, well, let me define phenotype. It's by um, the dictionary definition, it's the outward characteristics or manifestations of an organism. And of course, that can include many things. Um, uh, it, uh, Morphometric, anthropometric, physiological, um, uh, clinical, and even psychological. And then endotypes is the discovery of the hidden pathways within the pathobiology, if you like, um, that leads to phenotypes. And that's where the drug discovery is all going on right now with an increasingly better understanding of the inflammatory pathways in asthma. So the, the Severe Asthma Research Program uh, has really uh, identified, and uh, Gina has adopted uh, a number of asthma clinical phenotypes that you know, um, basically allergic and non-allergic asthma, but also these subgroups, such as asthma associated with obesity and asthma in um, middle-aged women, and asthma uh, with fixed airflow obstruction. And uh, they can be broadly classified into the allergic uh, TH2 driven pathways and the non TH2 uh, driven pathways. And we'll look at those pathways in a little more detail. Now, one of the challenges of asthma, as shown here, looking at these, these cluster analyses, is that the symptoms don't always correlate um, with the degree of eosinophilic inflammation. Um, in the middle section of this diagram, of course, we have correlation. Um, we have the classic fixture, fi features of concordant disease, um, which um, leads to a much more straightforward therapeutic approach. Um, but there are patients um, who are much more symptomatic, uh, lacking uh, features or measures of inflammation, who are much more difficult. And then there are the patients with um, discordant inflammation who have the biomarkers <clears throat> of inflammation but relative paucity of symptoms. And this poses some of the challenges um, to managing the asthma. So in this topographical cluster analysis, um, this involved something like 145 patients and more than 70 clinical pathophysiological characteristics you know, some of which you can see here. Uh, this is the type of approach that's being used right now to try and identify these uh, subphenotypes. And this particular diagram is color-coded, um, red being the most symptomatic of these patients. And again, you can see, as suggested in the previous slide, that there are patients who are both highly symptomatic and others um, less so. So um, these approaches are all well and good. Um, this slide is, is a little um, effective as far as formatting is concerned. But um, when we start to think about biomarkers, we can think about clinical features and symptoms and exacerbations. For example, symptom scores. Um, airway hyperreactivity is due to multiple mechanisms, but in itself could be thought of as a biomarker. Um, exhaled NO, blood eosinophils, sputum eosinophils are features of inflammation, 
and Perry Austin uh, could be, uh, or has been advocated to be uh, associated with airway remodeling. Now, um, I love these uh, diagrams by Guy Brussel. Uh, they really bring all of the pathobiological pathways into perspective, I think. And on the left, you have the TH true driven pathway that we spoke of earlier with the antigen presenting cells with a number of cytokines, the uh, IL4, IL13 pathway driving B cells, the IL5 pathway driving the eosinophils. And, and, and at the same time, we have the, the non allergic pathway, um, which interestingly, from my perspective, being um, concerned with COPD, can be triggered by inhaled particulates and fumes to trigger other pathways and we'll come back to these upstream cytokines towards the end of the talk. Two innate lymphoid cells also driving uh, through IL-5 and asymptomatic airway inflammation um, and other mechanisms. Now, I'm going to talk a fair bit about acidophilic inflammation in the 2H2 pathway because that's where all the activity is and the new biologics have emerged. Um, but one of the things that um, is a, a bit of a conundrum is um, the exact role of acidophilic in post defense and in airway inflammation. You know, how much of their role is um, helpful? And, and how much is um, harmful. And this slide is, I think, one of the you know, more interesting slides that I can present to you this morning because it suggests, you know, in this view, um, that there are homeostatic or regulatory areas in the fields that are a normal part of host defense. And then there are the inflammatory, the infiltrating areas in the fields that proliferate in inflammatory airways disease. These are driven by interleukin-5. Um, these homeostatic ones are IL-5 independent. And in, in this context, and this, this statement may lead to some debate, but um, it, it is questionable whether it is a good thing to completely eliminate eosinophils. Um, because if you indiscriminately eliminate the homeostatic eosinophils at the same time as those that are responsible for inflammation, you could potentially have um, harmful effects in terms of um, compromising the host immune response. So you see where that uh, argument can go, and I'll leave that with you. I've got a question for you. Um, it says that these are IL-5 independent, and yet they express the IL-5. Yes. Receptor. How does that happen? Yeah, you're, you're right. I noticed that as I was reviewing the slide. Um, when when I, uh, this was first presented to me, you know, the um, they, they expressed the receptor, so a drug that targets the receptor um, could potentially uh, affect these as well as all other uh, types. Symptoms, but um, a drug that just targets circulating AL, IL-5 would have a greater effect um, on these inflammatory air symptoms. At least that's the, the hypothesis. I don't think this is by any means proven at this stage. Any comments? <laughs> you okay. So, um, of course, eosinophils and exhaled nitric oxide are very predictive of clinical features of asthma. So um, whether that be symptoms, wheeze, um, other features, uh, asthma exacerbations. Um, in this two-dimensional plotting, you can see that both high FENO and high uh, eosinophils um, increase the probability of features of that. So we're, we're quite familiar with that. Now, in the development of biologic therapy in severe asthma, we've seen uh, something of an evolution. Um, Peter Howard has presented the 
this is three generations. The first generation, the anti-IgE drug, onalizumab. The second generation that is really targeting the TH2 pathway specifically. And then, more recently, the anti-alarming therapies that are working further upstream, anti-TSLP and anti-IL-33 receptor. And I'll talk a little bit about those and, and try to present some data on those treatments as well. So anti-IG therapy, I think you're all well familiar with um, omalizumab, which is well established um, and has found a role in the treatment of asthma, um, where asthma is associated with high IgE levels and of course is, um, is given on a, a weight-based and IgE level <coughs> basis. Um, it really um, acts by reducing circulating IgE. IgE, of course, um, it binds uh, both antigen-presenting cells and also mast cells, so it's broadly involved in the stimulation of Th2 inflammation and also the degranulation of mast cells the consequences of that. Um, so this is, a, I think, a well-established therapy. Um, I'm sure you've had much more experience of using this treatment than, than I have as a pulmonologist. Um, it produces a small in decrease um, in, in blood eosinophils, not nearly as much as an anti-IL-5 drug like Nepolizumab here, uh, which is shown <coughs> And there is an overlap, which is interesting, between patients who might be deemed clinically eligible for anti-IgE treatment and those who could be eligible for anti-IL-5 therapy. Now, omalizumab reduces um, asthma exacerbations. Uh, there has been a Cochrane review on this, and there's a wealth of data. Um, I, I didn't have time, unfortunately, to include that Cochrane slide, um, but I think you're, you're well familiar with this data. Um, an anti-IL-5 therapy um, could arguably produce a greater improvement um, in terms of reducing exacerbations. Um, and there's some questions about um, omalizumab, um, how long do we treat patients for, um, what are the consequences of ever stopping treatment, um, what about those patients who definitely uh, are candidates for anti-IL-5 therapy, um, as well as having been treated with a um, And GSK has recently conducted a study called the OSMO study, where people who've been on omalizumab prior um, were switched to mepolizumab, um, and it, uh, what was demonstrated was that they could be adequately treated or maintained or even have um, reduction in exacerbation rates um, when switched from anti-IG to anti-IL-5 therapy. Um, I mean, ultimately, this is going to be a clinical judgment, I think, but um, this data at least shows, um, it highlights the overlap and the overlapping treatment effects um, of these two classes of drugs in reducing exacerbations. And this is mainly driven um, by um, the exacerbations requiring um, emergency room visits, but not, not necessarily hospitalization. These are small numbers uh, with non-significant differences here. It's really um, those, those milder exacerbations that are prevented. Now, there's an interesting uh, study by not looking at um, the withdrawal um, I certainly, um, when I was more active in clinical practice, I faced this dilemma of how long to continue omalizumab, and I'd be interested in your viewpoints on this, but, um, and I settled for, for continuing it longer term. Now, this study, after six years of omalizumab, uh, patients were withdrawn, um, and you can see that after one year, um, about 50% of them um, were really unchanged, um, but after three years, there was a slight shift 
in the proportion of patients who actually felt that they were improved. And the conclusions from this paper were that, that you could, after six years at least, withdraw this drug um, and anticipate clinical stability, at least in some patients. And I think this is helpful because it, it's known, for example, if you withdraw omalizumab after one year, uh, it's likely that the patients will return to their previous clinical state and be under control. Other than just clinical reporting, were there any other measures in those patients? Uh, no, no this were, this, these were pretty soft endpoints. What, what are people's experience of prolonged omalizumab therapy and withdrawal? Anyone? I mean, I think the pragmatic part is that, like anything else, if people have really had a major clinical improvement, they will resist being stopped. <laughs> right, so, right. So it's kind of a... It's an interesting you know, group of people who were on it for urticaria have grown the use of the drug dramatically, they're always itching, no pun intended, <laughs> to stop um, or, or length of the duration. <laughs> that was bad. But the asthma patients don't ask that question. Yeah. yeah. It's, the, it's the same dilemma with any secondary preventative treatments. Yeah. They don't stop at any of them. We have this debate right now with in health with the steroids. Okay, so let moving on to the anti-TH2 therapy. So, um, again, the, um, the diagram of P. Brazil um, shows the TH2 pathway and the important role of interleukin-5. Now, uh, we have IL-5 arising from the allergic and the non-allergic pathways uh, stimulating the eosinophils and Interleukin-5, as you probably know, is responsible um, not only for the proliferation and maturation of ASMPs in the bone marrow, but their migration through the blood uh, to the tissues and their infiltration in the tissues. And um, the ASMPs have a very broad range of, of effects on different cell populations. Um, we have uh, essentially three drugs, apolizumab, resbizumab, and venrelizumab, uh, that can target the IL-5 pathway. Uh, as you know, resbizumab and apolizumab uh, bind circulating IL-5, whereas venrelizumab uh, targets the IL-5 receptor. And I think there is data that shows that you get a much more dramatic uh, depletion of ASMPs with venrelizumab that are targeting and as opposed to these other two drugs. And what I alluded to earlier was you know, whether that would be advantageous in terms of clinical endpoints or advantageous in terms of the patient's constitutive um, sinful populations. That we don't really know at this point. Um, so there are some differences, of course. Um, <coughs> Resinizumab is an intravenous medication. Um, Repo and then are given subcutaneously. They have slightly different um, approved indications in terms of <clears throat> threshold eosinophil levels, and that's a debate in and of itself. Um, and um, and, and um, yet, I think, think the route of administration is certainly going to be something that affects um, choice of therapy. At this point, um, only having the intravenous option is something of a, a disadvantage for this human. So, mepolizumab suppresses blood eosinophils, not completely, uh, but this is some data that was recently presented at the ATS showing prolongation of the effect up to about um, four years. And uh, <clears throat> that, that is what we would expect with mepolizumab. Um, in the clinical trial development program from the DREAM study, the NANSA study, the SIRIUS study, and GSK has accumulated data showing uh, reduction of exacerbations 
and then serious study showing um, the oral cortical steroid sparing of about 50% in terms of cumulative dosage. So these are the types of percentage reductions in asthma exacerbations that can be anticipated with metolizumab. Now, if we compare um, mepo and benralizumab, looking at the Mensa Muska studies, this was uh, another study uh, which uh, illustrated a beneficial effect on health status measured by SGMQ. We compare with Sirocco and Kalima. Again, you can see fairly similar uh, reductions in exacerbation rates um, with these two different drugs. And, you know, there's going to be different points of view, I'll admit. Um, it may be at the end of the day that the clinical benefits of these two medications are quite similar. And uh, my AZ colleagues might, um, might be willing to agree with that statement. Whether there will be other advantages that play out remains. These, these are not head to head studies. This no, is just comparing no. outcomes in separate studies. No, no that, that's absolutely right. But it's lovely to lead into the next slide. Uh, this recent um, publication by Lucy um, has, is one of the indirect treatment comparisons. And, and there have been half a dozen indirect treatment comparisons of these biologics. And, why do we do indirect treatment comparisons? Because uh, the, in situations where there are no head-to-head -head comparisons of any of these medications, if we can have a reference, such as a comparison of each one of them with placebo, uh, then we can develop mathematically indirect treatment comparisons. There are indirect treatment comparisons published by the Cochrane Database of Systematic that suggest really little difference between these medications. This PUSI study, I think, was interesting in a way. I mean, the indirect treatment comparison is like any clinical trial. It can be subject to selection bias. And PUSI uh, picked all the available published data. Uh, one of the challenges is that if different patient populations have been selected for studies, like an obvious example was if <clears throat> they were selected for different eosinophil levels, then it's hard to make a fair comparison between medications. But um, I'll just give you a quick glimpse of, of the results in terms of um, this, the results of this indirect treatment comparison, rate of severe exacerbations, um, here favoring the MEPO, uh, no difference between resolizumab and here, um, change from baseline ECQ score, again, stratified by eosinophils. So that, you know, these higher eosinophil levels, um, the, the, the MEPO seems to be favored. Now, I'd be interested in comments from the room. I don't want to present this as a definitive conclusion that MEPO is better than any of the other drugs. Um, that's not my purpose this morning, but um, this is a recent publication. Um, I welcome any comments, other perspectives on this. Yeah, I think, I think it's important. So a more Cambodian and allergist San Francisco, now uh, medical director of AstraZeneca on uh, Benalizumab. Can you comment, Dr. Cooper, on the methodology that was used in these indirect treatment comparisons? There were, as you know, three published in September alone, um, each with a predictable outcome based on sponsorship of the trial. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. um, ha you mentioned before differences in, in clinical trial design as well as uh, patient population study. Um, and it's important when you're doing a comparative trial, and clearly there's not head to head, to control for as much of the heterogeneity as possible. Right. Some methodologies are far superior scientifically than others. So, I'm wondering, A, how you controlled for that, um, and then a follow-up, uh, if you will, please. Yeah, well, that's the, the pertinent question. Um, this, I believe this indirect treatment 
comparison was more inclusive uh, than prior published comparisons, um, including the Cochrane systematic review. But you know, to be honest, you can argue these statistically one way or another. I think your comment about the sponsor <laughs> being there. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 is this one of the sponsors? It is. It's, it is GSK sponsor. I think it's difficult because um, what you want to do, you mentioned variables that can contribute to asthma severity. And oftentimes there's overlap between those and what predict, what are signals for response to therapy, if you will. So if you just stratify, stratify based on eosinophil count and we're not controlling for within that stratification, the degree of nasal polyposis, the, the number of exacerbations historically, um, BMI, uh, duration of asthma disease, all that. So there's a, there's a more scientifically rigorous process, a MACE analysis, right, that's, that's, um, uh, that sort of aligns these different parameters and weights them so that there's parity. And if you use that scientific methodology, um, outcomes are a bit different, right? So we just published in the European Respiratory Journal and we included all those parameters and we, and we controlled for them to try to introduce as much homogeneity as possible and really eliminate bias that's inherent when you just stratify based on one parameter, such as eosinophils. And as you could expect, the outcomes were a bit different. And, and I think I, I raise that not because um, there's a numerical you know, superiority for Benra in that, as I suppose one would expect. But I bring it up not to broadcast that, but to say that if you do maximize the scientific integrity of a comparison, now ideally that's in a head-to-head -head trial. It's not going to happen, unfortunately. But if you maximize that scientific integrity, there's really parity to your earlier point among these biologics, right? And I think it's, especially in the CME context, I think it does a disservice to sort of just stratify based on eosinophil count. I feel blasphemous saying that because it's in Jackie and it's Bill Bussey's name on the paper, both of whom I have tremendous respect for. Um, but I think it's responsible, particularly for pharma, to, to really be inclusive and control for as much of those, you know, as many of those variables as we can. So that's that's the only point I would make. No, I'm I, happy I to, to we, discuss. We are yeah. aligned yeah. Well, in our thinking on this, and uh, I'm not sure. I haven't carefully looked at your recent publication, but I I, I don't know whether I'll conclude that the um, the mathematical approach or the scientific rigor yeah. um, has any advantages over previous right. studies. Uh, I think at the end of the day. Even these treatment effects or differences are, are relatively small in clinical terms, and I think we're going to honestly conclude that there's their equivalence. I think so. I, and I think Matt, I, I would just uh, suggest everybody also read Jeff Drazen's editorial in the New England Journal, Absolutely. Uh, which in effect says the drug companies really owe it to us to do direct head to head comparisons, not only of these drugs, but also. Receptor, or possibly an older map, because it's the only way we'll really know. Not not which is better than the other, but in certain circumstances, which is the appropriate drug of choice. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. And, I, and I, agree. I I fully agree with that. And um, I don't think those are the decisions that, that, that Dr. Gordon or I would make, unfortunately, right. in driving that kind of decision making. But the, you know, the methodology that we use, the Mace analysis, which, which is a matched, um, um, uh, inclusive, you know, sort of trial where they really do try to control. So if, if there's a greater number of polyposis patients in that greater than 300 group in one trial, then we weight that so that there's, you know, that it's sort of equal across the board. It's the methodology that's used by payers, um, by NICE, by advisory boards, regulatory boards, et cetera. Um, so each of these sort of reviews, uh, meta-analysis or otherwise, should obviously be taken with a grain of salt is sort of, I think, um, the final point. What was your approach to stratifying by eosinophils? Because you tended to include a different population. Yeah, so we they really just control for all that. So we didn't stratify just based on eosinophil counts greater than 400 or 300 or 150. Because if you do that, then you miss these other variables that inherently contribute to response to therapy. Right. So if you've got, for example, if we are comparing 300, 300. Um, these patients exacerbated more at baseline or had different OCS uh, burden, we weighted that so that there's parity across the board. Yes. Uh, and it really demonstrated, again, fairly similar outcomes. Yeah. 
What's the citation of your most recent publication? It's in the European Respiratory Journal, uh, Pro Professor Bourdain from, from Paris. Um, I'm happy to show that after. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to take all of this information yeah. into consideration. I mean, I, I, I take your point about multiple confounders. They should be adjusted for as best possible. But I will say, a cynical count is still a principal driver of exacerbation. Absolutely. And therefore, you know, the weighting of that um, should be taken into consideration. And you know, when you only you target your clinical trials only on a patient population with higher ASMR counts, arguably you might get a better result you know, if you have a, a much broader inclusion. I, I agree with that, but I suppose the point is if you have, for example, in the trials that you mentioned the inclusion, you showed sort of inclusion criteria as far as previous exacerbations. Two and above for both mepo and bendolizumab, um, but that doesn't mean that all of those patients exacerbated two times in the previous twelve months, right? So ours was closer to three, um, and and there's variability within each of those sort of background demographic criteria that we stratify based upon, and so um, leveling that by weighting, you know, sort of normalizing those, so now you have a matched analysis um, is important. Nasal polyps predict response just as much as these animal counts, depending on which trial you look at, right? And so um, having parity there in the analysis, I think, is, is critical. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think well, let's leave it that, um, which short of a head-to-head -head analysis, which pharma, I don't think, is going to pay for, is not going to happen since these drugs are already approved, we don't have an answer. and. You can analyze it in different ways and come up with parity, or you can come up with one better than another. And future use of these drugs will probably prove the answer. Thank you. Sorry. For no, fine. No, I no, right. should, should have a seat at the table. This, this discussion. Yeah. Thank you. This is probably uh, balanced in what the audience wants to hear. Good. So moving on then from the confrontational area <laughs> to additional therapies targeting the TH2 pathway. So um, dupilumab is an interesting player in all of this, and the IL-4 and the IL-13. I haven't got any doubt on the brick Zumab, uh, which targets IL-13, uh, but uh, clearly dupilumab, um, it's approved, of course, by the FDA, and um, it, it has a a slightly different bearing on the inflammatory pathways, but it clearly has an important role in the TH2-driven inflammatory process. Uh, so uh, dupil dupilumab improves lung function. This is Sally Wenzel's study. Um, so over 12 weeks, um, patients treated with dupilumab um, had better predicted FEV1 and absolute FEV1. Um, <clears throat> improvements in lung function and also reductions, quite dramatic reductions in asthma exacerbations um, in this same paper. Now, um, I think you've had a comment also about the, the, you know, the recent press release on polyposis for dupilumab. I mean, this is, uh, predictably, I would say, is going to look very good in patients with polyposis. So, moving on now to further upstream, um, we have the IL-33 and TSLP. I haven't got any doubt on IL-25, but you know this is um, a higher order uh, set of cytokines, if you like, upstream of the pathways that we've already discussed, and. Um, there, there, there is, uh, of course, data. Uh, I'll show you some data on TSLP and IL-33. Um, what role do they play um, in driving this inflammatory process? By going further upstream, uh, will we get a broader um, anti-inflammatory effect? Uh, who knows? Um, so, tezitalimab, which is an anti-TSLP drug, reduces sputum eosinophils as induced by allergen challenge, and this is a study protocol 
uh, where patients had allergen challenge and then they had tepalizumab uh, at different time points and repeated allergen challenge. Um, and you can see that in the anti-TSLP treated patients, the eosinophil response to repeated allergen challenge diminishes over time. And um, this is seen also both in the early and late phases of the response when you look at lung function. So this is a, a baseline, and then uh, day 42, day 84, you see the um, higher lung function is preserved, less of a fall, if you like, uh, in lung function in response to allergen challenge in the patients who are treated with tezitabinab. So again, this is interesting, relatively newcomer on the block, but this is a New England Journal paper, um, which I, I dare say you have seen. It also reduces um, exhaled NO and eosinophils. So though it's targeting upstream, it's um, manifesting its effects in these downstream measures of inflammation. Um, and that you can see in the top, you've got mean change in pheno, the three treated groups compared with placebo. Um, and here at the bottom, you've got uh, change in eosinophil counts as well. So an, an interesting new player. And also an um, improvement in FEV1 at the bottom here in the three uh, dosages in this particular study, and reductions in exacerbations um, of the order of 70 to 80 percent, which is quite impressive. So we'll see how this evolves. Um, um, here's um, a breakdown of acid exacerbations by uh, inflammatory markers of TH2 status, if you like, um, showing across the board um, reduction in acid exacerbations with this drug. Uh, finally, anti IL 35. Um, this is a member of the IL 1 superfamily, and it has a complex signaling mechanism here, which involves binding to <coughs> ST. And then forming a heterodynamic um, complex here. And this is the IL 33, um, and this is the ST2 molecule with three components. And it's an interesting in that it lacks a secretory peptide. Um, the IL 3 uh, can be cleaved in the inflammatory process, and it's thought that the fragments of IL 33 are what enhance cytokine activity and uh, provoke the inflammatory response. So um, the pathobiology of IL-3 pathways, um, again, they involve multiple inflammatory cells here um, derived from injured epithelial cells originally. Um, IL-33 receptor is upregulated in all inflammatory phenotypes, so these are the classic um, asthma phenotypes, allergic, uh, pussy, hemolytic, and so on. Um, but especially the eosinophil high phenotypes of asthma, um, IL-33 receptor is upregulated, and the IL-33 receptor correlates um, with sputum eosinophils, although it does not correlate um, with neutrophils. Correlates inversely with lung function across multiple inflammatory endotypes. So this is FEV1, admittedly not a strong correlation, uh, but significant nonetheless. And the different inflammatory phenotypes are different color coded um, here. Now, this interesting data. Um, Can I ask you, how was that being measured in the previous slide, the IL 33 receptor? This is from a from what sort of sample do you uh, remember? I'm, I'm not sure. Just, we don't norm. I mean, I imagine it's not an easy thing to measure in a right. clinical setting. Uh, well, this has not found prime time yet by any means. But it's interesting now because in a genome-wide association study, there, there is a, signal, a genetic signature uh, <coughs> from, from related to IL-33. 
screen and this being the journal publication. And then um, there is a rare loss of IL-13 function, a mutation uh, that results in uh, a fall in eosinophil count on average of 0.22 to the uh, cells per microinch, I guess, and a reduction in exacerbation. Or, or prob probability of asthma, I think it is, um, of, of uh, 53%. So it's protected in a way, uh, this rare loss of function mutation against asthma, which is pretty good uh, proof of principle that this uh, has an important role um, in the clinical emergence of asthma. Is there any downside to having a mutation? Uh, uh, that I don't know. Rodanina, um, this, what is the clinical relevance of IL-17? Um, I just add this um, for completion. Uh, it probably has an important role in driving neutrophilic inflammation. So um, in the non-eosinophilic, more neutrophilic uh, types of inflammation, I think all this could be true in uh, broad inflammatory diseases like inflammatory bowel disease but also in immune diseases as well. Um, <laughs> neutrophilic um, asthma, of course, um, this, this pathway could be important um, um, in targeting that subphenotype of asthma. Um, and there is a gene expression, um, TH17 signature um, here, um, that um, could indicate if we could clearly identify that subgroup of patients with more neutrophilic inflammation uh, that targeting this pathway um, could be important. Um, so it could be a viable target. Um, and Rodal and Mab is here, uh, targeting IL-17. Uh, what data is available there? And the answer is um, it's really not altogether impressive uh, at this stage, plus it's steady. 320 adults um, really showed um, no differences in asthma control, and you could hardly say that there was a pattern of improvement in lung function. But you didn't stratify it by neutrophilic asthmatics, just all comers? So, um, just summarizing, uh, I tried to uh, highlight some of the areas in which biologic therapy has either developed, um, has established, and, and is developing. Again, uh, this is all part of this endeavor uh, to develop uh, these sub-phenotypes that will lend themselves to targeted therapy or, or personal, personalized treatment. And uh, we'll no doubt see a lot more uh, interesting development as we go further up the infantry cascade. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. say that um, it can't be assumed that more aggressive depletion of eosinophils is, is necessarily better for depletion. We, we simply don't know the answer to that. I mean, the question is, like, uh, they are not completely IL-5 independent. I mean, the development of eosinophils, I mean, we know that if we target IL-5, we cannot have eosinophils, in, at least in mice. So if they are IL-5 dependent, the, the question is how much IL-5 you will need to make these eosinophils and then under normal physiological states and whether our anti-IL-5 therapy, which has been studied now on short scope, I mean, nobody ever evaluated the, the, uh, the outcome when it comes to homeostatic eosinophils. Like, for instance, 
antibody production capacity. We know that eosinophils provide April and uh, long lived plasma cells on the bone marrow. And, but nobody ever evaluated the antibody production capacity after 10 or 15 years of home NTR5 therapy, for instance. Nobody ever evaluated uh, the risk of inflammatory bowel disease in NTR5 therapy after 20 years. I mean, we know that IgA is, is a protective factor and, uh, and against inflammatory bowel diseases, but nobody ever done such long-term evaluation of safety of uh, like nephalizumab or rastuzumab have been only in the market for several years. So this, probably these effects need to be evaluated later on, like after 15 years from starting the therapy, which is not so feasible at this point. Um, yeah. Well, um, of course, that data is being accumulated. Um, yeah, and this kind of... Data for all these drugs, but especially for nephalizumab, in the COSMO study, which is an extension of the NASA and NISPA study, yeah. so I think it's starting now after about eight years, um, without any... I mean, I mean, there is, there is, there is. The, I mean, the most common side effect, which is reported, which is nasopharyngitis, which by by any way doesn't even have an ICD-10. So I don't know what's nasopharyngitis. Is it means that recurrent upper respiratory tract infections, or is it uh, inflammation in the pharynx of the upper part of the pharynx? I mean, it's really kind of ambiguous side effects reported under anti therapy as the most common side effect. Is it this because we are? Uh, depleting the IgA in those patients, they have recurrent now upper respiratory tract infection, or is it the stains of pharyngitis, a new disease entity, or a new side effect reported by those patients? Right. I, I've always interpreted that as un unrelated. Do people report everything, because the FDA requires that they report it. It's not drug-related, it's just normal getting sick. But what stains of pharyngitis? Is it yeah, cold? Common, common cold. cold, right? Yeah, it's common cold. It's yeah. common cold. <laughs> they always appear in yeah. CFP. Um, a couple of points, but if I may. The first is I, I, um, the mouse data, uh, as we know, doesn't always translate uh, into humans. And those resident eosinophils in the mice do have different surface markers uh, than, than human eosinophils, as you know. Um, and I think, to your point, it's, it's uh, probably a combination. It's probably not all just peripheral eosinophilia that are clinically relevant. Um, what's happening in the tissue is probably, when we're at least talking about disease state, not so much adverse events in there. Um, it's what's happening in the tissue. I think that data is probably more relevant than, than peripheral eosinophils. Um, um, and finally, to your point, ben, I mean, MEPO has been uh, post-market in, in humans for just several years, but, but we, have, there, we have human data um, going back further than that with methylizumab, and, and there really are no safety signals as of yet, which is encouraging, and ultimately that will be the, the test. Uh, we only have two-year data with Bora, uh, we've got a little bit longer with MEPO, and, and both are very encouraging. So I, yeah, think, I think that's great. To that point, the intellectual risk that we assign sometimes is real, and it's, it's not to be dismissed. And really, the only way we're going to know is with that, with that long-term human data. Sure. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Matthew, any comments? Well, thank you very much. Good, yeah, good discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
was too late. They uh, oh and not gosh, you're not three or two. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I, you still have the lip came up and like trail came out on that. Pr parental parental mom. Yeah. And he's like, well, yeah, we must knock on the door after the door. The pre mummy don't have this. Like, yes, it's a cool. No. I'm just telling him how. And he and it's the face two A data. I was going to have all these slides. I always couldn't. 